Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, we are going to just do a quick debate about the um, the atrocities in the in the Bible compared to the Quran, and uh, obviously you can bring the hadith, no problem, and also the uh, the, the morality between Islam and the Bible comparison as well. I think it comes under the same subheading. So I'm just going to make a few points and expect uh, paper boy here to respond to that. Uh, first, I'm going to bring up this particular verse here. It's about, you know, there's many times you hear in the newspapers now, the term honor killing. What's honor killing? So for example, if something happens to a girl in your family and it brings shame to your family, they murder the girl or the woman, whoever is. Uh, now, where did this originate or where do we find this? In which scripture do we find this? Do we find this in the Quran or the Hadith? Or do we find this in the Bible? Because in the Bible, I've come across this. I don't know, maybe you can, I, you can tell me what it means if it's uh, other than what, what is that face value here. So in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 9, it says, And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father. Profane here basically brings. Uh, Just repeat Leviticus what? Levi Leviticus 21 9. So dishonor, kind of, it brings dishonor to the father. If the if the priest's daughter is a whore, that means she she's like a prostitute, sleeping around, then she brings dishonor to the father. Then what is the punishment? It says there, any and and the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father. She shall be burnt with fire. So basically burn her alive. That's what it means. That is a punishment, the capital punishment that should be applied to a woman who brings dishonor to her father and specifically that of a priest, the daughter of a priest. And in another verse in Deuteronomy 22, 20, yes, it says, but suppose the man's accusations are true and he can show that she was not a virgin the woman must be taken to the door of her father's home and there the men of the town must stone her to death. 30 seconds. What, what verse is that, sorry? Uh, Deuteronomy 22, 20. For she has committed a disgraceful crime in Israel by being promiscuous while living in her parents' home. In this way, you will purge the evil from among you. So if you can please explain that. 22. Deuteronomy 22, 20. I'm glad the paper boy. I'm just looking for the verse. Yeah. So. Are you ready? My pipe was late. Okay. Have you started this time? Three, two, yeah. One. Okay. So, what exactly is your question? I already mentioned it at the very beginning. This is the yeah. honor killing. Do you agree or disagree with this? Uh, well, I think at the time, in terms of the mosaic laws. Uh, we have to understand the purpose of the laws was to set apart the Israelites from other nations. So God is very strict in terms of what he calls righteousness. And if I'm like the first verse was about the daughter of a priest. So the priests were even a higher caliber and their family would have been known to be a, of a higher stand, to be held in a higher standard in terms of like how they conduct themselves. So if the woman is seen as a whore, well, not a whore, but entering into- It says whore, yeah. Okay, yeah. If, if it says whore yeah. in that translation. So we see in terms of the old Mosaic laws, God dealt with Israel in a, um, in a way of the time, because that was, um, I can't remember, the, the Bronze Age, around the Bronze Age, I believe. So God deal, deals with Israel in a way that is suitable to what they understand. So I'm not sure what you're kind of pointing so you, out. So you are justifying it? Well, I think in terms of when we look at how God dealt with people, for example, we know that people were stoned to death. But now as Christians, we don't stone people to death. But then within Islam, people are still stoned to death for adultery and fornication. So. I'm not sure why in this case where in Deuteronomy 22, 20, where it says if she's not a virgin, she shall be stoned 
because that means if she's not a virgin, she's committed adultery. But then in the very in the Quran, we see the very same punishment that if someone has c committed adultery or fornication, they are expected yeah. to be That's stoned right. to death as well. Surah is removed from the Quran. That surah is removed from the Quran. So, yes. is that it? Yeah, so in terms of whether I think it's right or wrong, I think it's for that time, it was justified for that time, mm -hmm. for for a way for people to understand how to deal with situations that time. Because obviously as Christians, we do not follow these practices, but we understand that God set a law. The purpose of that law was to sh highlight the sin within people. So when they transgress it, they're able to be seen as a transgressor of the law. So there's certain many things in the Old Testament which we don't follow as Christians. And again, that's why I point to adultery. But then if uh, Hashim has something against stoning people to death, then he should have a problem within his own Quran where adulterers and fornicators can be stoned to death. Okay, um, I don't know if you actually understood the point I was making here. Yeah. So the first point, yeah, you can start, yeah. yeah. So the point I was trying to make here is that one is set a woman on fire yes. if she basically sleeps around yes. yes and you said at the time of moses that was okay because that was a law they were set uh at they were, uh, their standards were set to a, a higher standard than ours yes but no, no to people at that time yeah, yeah. Rather than at that time means moses time right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's what i'm saying a woman at moses time is a woman no different to the woman today and a child at the time of moses is no different to a child today also, in the New Testament, this is the verse we find. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Yes. This is the New Testament. Yes. All scripture includes the Old Testament. Yes? So whatever atrocities you find, which you by your today's standard, as you're saying, is something that you don't find... Sorry, today it's, it's not okay, but at that time it was okay. So according to this verse, all scripture is God breathed and it should be used for teaching and rebuking. Yeah. Okay? So you cannot say it's in the Old Testament, so we use a different standard, a different ruling. And also it says in Psalm 119, 160, mm -hmm. it says, All your words are true. That means all of God's words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Mm -hmm. Yes? So it's not for the mentor of Moses only. What does eternal mean? For all time. All your laws are eternal. So Paper boy, I don't know how you can substantiate the laws of Moses only apply during the time of Moses. If that was true, then why in Matthew 15, 3 and 4, we find Jesus saying this is a command of God, that anyone who curses the mother or father shall be put to death. Yes, 1200 years after Moses, Jesus is still repeating the words that came in Exodus. So in Exodus, this was a command. Anyone who curses the mother or father shall be put to death. An Old Testament law, which Jesus repeats in the New Testament. If it wasn't applicable for the time of Jesus, why would he repeat it? And you know what he says to that? He says, this is the command of God. Yes? So read Matthew 15, 3 and 4, and you will see that this is not only applicable for that time. Okay? By the way, it's disturbing. So can you just tell him not to do that? Because none of the Muslims are doing it. You are, because you're talking. You're, you're talking. Yes. Are you? I hope so. So... What we are saying is that this law, if it was applicable only during the time of Moses, then Jesus wouldn't say that the law, if anyone breaks the law and changes even a jot, shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. Yes? Which law was he talking about during the time of Jesus? There was only the Old Testament as a book which was there. The New Testament wasn't written yet. It is going to be written a few decades after him, or in some cases, even a few centuries after him. So where do we get this understanding that this is only applicable for the time of Moses. If that is the case, then you should substantiate from the Bible where it says these laws were only applicable for the time of Moses and not afterwards because these two passages that I gave you from Psalms and from Timothy, both of them indicate that these are applicable for all time. The laws are eternal and it's very clear. Now I can find many such atrocities in the Bible. The other, the other thing I find quite disturbing is killing of children. Why is the biblical God so obsessed with killing children, targeting children in particular? We find this in 1 Samuel 15, 3 and 4. Yes, so you can read 1 Samuel from the beginning and you'll get the idea where he says basically to kill every male, female, every child and every infant and even the domestic animals like the oxes and the, and the, 
the camels and so on. Yes? Why, 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 why is God specifically mentioning these children be killed? And, and guess what? Not by God. So it's not like a calamity like the flood or the plagues sent by God directly. This is their God telling the reason he's telling them this. Yes? Is because this is what God tells them. Go and kill them. That means the human beings are sanctioned to kill other human beings. So it's not God raining down brimstones or flood like the tsunami or something. It is basically saying these people, the, the Israelites at that time, were to go from door to door. Obviously, I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing here. And to kill every male, every female, every child and every infant. And not to spare even the domestic animals. And then he says in... Um, in, in, in Moses, uh, in, in, in Numbers 31, 17, 18, again, kill everyone except the virgin girls who haven't slept, slept with other men. There you go. Okay, wait, wait, so... Wait, wait. So... Wait, wait, wait. Three, two, one. Hashim's oh. mentioned various points, um, and from, throughout the conversation, I'll try and address all of them because I don't want to spend my time just answering his questions because I want to kind of reflect back if he has certain issues, then he would have to explain what we find within Islam. Mm. So, for example, in Surah 1874 and 80, we have the story of uh, Khadir. And I'll just read that out briefly. So it says... Khadir, Khadir. 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 Yes. So it says, so they joined on till when they met a young boy, he slew him. Moses said, what hast thou slain an innocent person without his having slain anyone? Surely thou hast done a hideous thing. So we clearly see Moses was in shock. Mm. And then it says, And as for the youth, his parents were believers, and we feared least on growing up, he should involve them into trouble through rebellion and disbelief. Now when we look at the tafsir of Al-Tabari, Al-Tabari, yeah. Al yeah. he says, uh, actually, let me go to the tafsir of Al-Jalalain. So it'll take me one second to find it. Because in Al Jalalain, if you want me to find it, I'll I'll just repeat. Well, say it's your, it's your I'll, time, I'll it's up to you. And Do what you want. So basically in Al Jalalain, he says the boy was a young boy who had not even reached puberty. So now if Hashim has a, a problem with God killing children, we have to look at his own Islamic literature, which says a prophet killed a young boy who had not even reached puberty. And in the tafsir, it says he slits his throat and smashes his head oh, against the rock. No now, if you yeah. want me to read Shh, the tafsir of Al Jalalain, I will. And yes, please. You, you provide it. evidence. That's the important okay. thing. I will go to the tafsir. Yeah, uh, yeah, if you can. You, are you going to address my points as well? I hope. Yeah, 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 okay. Right, let me just find. You got 30 right. seconds. Okay, so it says in the tafsir of Al Jalalain, mm. so they set off after leaving the ship, making their way on foot until when they met a boy who had not yet reached puberty, playing with other boys, amongst whom his face was the fairest. And he, Al Qadir, slew him by slitting his throat with a knife whilst he lay down, or by tearing off his head with his hand, or by smashing his head against a wall, all which are different opinions. Coordinating of blah, 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 is used here because it indicates the slaying took place after the encounter. So basically, there's different opinions on how he was It's finished, yeah, it's finished his time? Three different okay. ways he finished his time, right? So very come, atrocious. come on, be fair, man. So I, my question would be to Hashim, why would a young boy, why would it be right to rip off the head of a young boy and smash it against the rock? Okay, first and foremost, the surah doesn't say rip off, cutting off the, the head, neither does it say it was a prepubescent boy. You started my time? Yeah. None of that is in the surah. Now you have to find where did Jalalin get that from. It could be from Israelite, uh, and basically sources which are unfounded. And this happens many times in tafsir. they do. They do mention things from the Israelite sources. Yes, which cannot be substantiated. So even if it was the case, this is the important difference between mass massacre of children, 
and killing one boy. It says gulamun in the, in the surah. A gulamun can be a young boy. Yes? It says, the difference is this. There are two things which are distinguishing factors in this. Yes? So in the case of the Khidr, killing the boy, it was a punishment carried out on future generations for the crimes of the, for, sorry, uh, for, this, uh, yeah, for the crime of the forefathers. So the Khidr incident involved the guilty, the guilty party. That means this is what he was going to do in the future. Why did Khidr know this? Because God told him so. It is like someone having foreknowledge about Hitler. Yes? And you kill only Hitler. Yes? When he's a boy. Because of the divine knowledge that you have got, that this particular boy is going to commit atrocities in the future or some crime in the future, to avert that particular crime in the future, God has given special knowledge to Khidr Obviously not about the entire community, like it does in uh, Numbers 31 and in uh, 1 Samuel 15. It's not one boy or one girl, it is the entire population. In fact, it says in Numbers 31, 17, 18, uh, sorry, in, the, in Numbers 31, the number of people that were saved, the number of virgin girls that were saved was 32,000. So these were the virgins. How did they know they were virgins in the first place? Yes? How did they know? You know, by most likely by the age, because they used to get married at a very young age so they would know by that now in the case of Khidr like I said it was a selective punishment it wasn't something that was on the whole community secondly what is the issue that I have is this that in the Old Testament also in the New Testament I gave Matthew 15 3 and 4 again any any uh, anyone who curses the mother or father shall be put to death so it is not something only in the Old Testament, it is also mentioned in the New Testament. Again, children are involved. So if a child curses his mother or father, they should be put to death. And Jesus says this is a command of God. Yes? That was very quick, three minutes. <laughs> okay. And then it, it goes on to say, yeah, it goes on to say that this reason that was given in the Old Testament about the killing of these children and the women and men was what? It was vengeance. It wasn't because they were going to do something wrong in the future. That wasn't there. The reason mentioned in this verses was vengeance. The reason is already given. So the contention is the reason and the punishment on mass. Yes? Uh, Thank you. So, uh, you haven't still answered the question I asked earlier. But anyway. Yeah, as we go through, as I said previously, yeah. I'll respond to each of the questions. I don't okay. want to spend my time all of my time responding to yeah, yeah of course yeah each time i'll respond to each one of them yeah so he talks about the killing of the women and children mm. now if we go to numbers 25 it says whilst israel lived in shittim the people began to haul with the daughters of moab these invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their god so israel yoked himself to baal of peor and the anger of the lord was kindled against israel and the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord and that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So first we see God's retribution actually against Israel. Then God tells them, Moses, that they have to now seek retribution against the nation. That's why the women were killed. So therefore we see actually the reason of why it was. So God was not unjust, he actually punished Israel and the people. Because if we actually look at the verse, the, the Israelites kept the women and Moses was actually shocked. He said, what have you done? And Moses gave a judgment. It wasn't God, but it was Moses' discretion to um, deal with the justice that was given to him. And again, if we go to Al-Tabari, because this is what we see when we go to Islamic literature, they then start to say, oh, it's Daif, we don't know all the, the chains. It, it's important. You know, when, when it's something that they don't, they like, they will accept it when it's something that they don't like, they will reject it. But I'm going to read from Al Tabari, and it says, According to Hajj, Hajjaj ibn Jaray, when Salih told the eight evildoers that a boy would be born whose hands would be destroyed, they said, What do you command us? He said, I command you to kill them. That is their male, male children. So they killed them except one. And this is from the history of Al Tabari, prophets and patriarchs. So, in response also to Hashim's other statement about uh, Kadir, he said the young boy was going to be a transgressor. But if Allah is the all-merciful, wouldn't it be wise first to try and talk to that person to get them to avoid doing what they would do in the future, to say, look, this is a command from the God. 
turn away from the ways you are going in and at least give the person a choice to repent. But they have killed the boy before he's even committed the crime. This is what we would call injustice. And another story within the Quran, because we're talking about God's justice, is found in Al-Baqarah 66566. And I'd like Hashim's answer to these. So basically, it's a story of where the Israelites were forbid forbid forbidden from fishing on the Sabbath day, but then Allah would make fish come on the Sabbath day. So when the people were hungry and then they fish, Allah turned them into monkeys your and time's, your time's up. So why would Allah do that? Okay, we are talking about the atrocities against the children, which I told you, look, there's a difference between a young boy, like in the case of Khadr, and children and infants. Yes, because uh, 1 Samuel 15 actually uses the term infants. Now, infants are someone, children who are two years old and younger. Infant. 1 Samuel 15. Yes? Now, it says the reason that was given. It's not because, like I said, I've re I'm repeating myself again. This time I want you to listen. It wasn't because of some crime they're going to do in the future. It is God saying the reason was for the vengeance of what? happened to the Israelites at the hands of the Amalekites. So the reason given was for the vengeance against his people, against the people of God. Yes? That was the reason that their children, the four, uh, sorry, what, what the forefathers did, the forefathers of the Amalekites did to the Israelites during the Exodus. Now, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the people who actually harmed the Israelites who were killed, but it was the children's children, children, something like four centuries after. Now, why would God take vengeance after 400 years? I can only understand this from one reason, reasoning, which is basically when the Israelites, they were weak during the Exodus, so they couldn't take revenge against the Amalekites. When they become strong after 400 years, yes, they take revenge against them. And they say, this is what God told us to do, to kill every male, every female, every child, and every infant, two years old. Can you believe this? How can God target a two-year-old? Is that God scared of a two-year-old? Why would the babies be targeted? Now, with regards to the case of the Khidr, I've already explained that. With regards to killing an entire nation, it's very different to killing one person. For what? And this was also a lesson to Musa alayhi salam. That's the reason he was surprised. That why would he do such a thing? He did not agree with it. But in the case of Numbers 31, 19, he says, this is himself saying, that Moses, this was Moses' words to go and kill the women and to kill the virgins. and Sorry, to kill everyone except the virgins. So you see, Moses in the Bible is someone who is compared to be a person who commits atrocities against women and children. So they kill every boys who were even infants. Yes, but only save the virgin girls. Why? Why is this discrepancy there? Sorry, this uh, injustice there. Now, with regards to Allah telling Musa alayhi salam, uh, sorry, uh, Musa's people during the Sabbath, the fish will come. This was a test to them. Allah told them not to do something. Yes, so now the test is become more strong when they see the fish in front of them. Like during this time, the fish come. Obviously, they're going to be tempted by this. Now, this was a test. Our life in this world is a test. We see a lot of temptations around. Doesn't mean we have to fall for them. Yes, but those people, they fell for it. And only those people who fell for it, they were the ones who were turned into the, uh, into the monkeys and the pigs. Not all the Jews. Okay? Five. Carry on. Three, okay. Two, one, so Hashim talks about the Amalekites. Yes. And obviously, they attacked the Israelites when they were weak, mm. 400 years before. Now, we're seeing a double standard in terms of how Hashim applies his logic to God's justice. Because he says our, uh, the boy that al Qadir was going to kill was going to be a transgressor. But then... We know if God had slew the Amalekites 400 years before, those children would not have lived. So therefore, for God, he can slew them at any time because they're on borrowed time. Now, again, we actually look into the motivations of why God did it. Because when we see that same story, some of them actually lived. And hundreds of years later, we see, for example, in uh, 1 Samuel 30, it says, now when David and his men came to Ziklag, on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against Nagreb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women, 
and all the, them that were in it, both small and great, they killed no one but carried them off and went their way. So we see that these people still continued in how they were. They had not repented, but they still were barbarians killing and stealing people's wives. And we actually see further down the line, the same nation almost wipes out the whole Israel nation. So we can say in God's foreknowledge, he knew these people were hard of heart and they were never going to change their ways. Now, I'm going to talk, go back to the verse that he said about the, um, the Numbers Sabbath. 31? Oh, the, uh, the Quran, Sabbath. yeah, okay. And I just want to read the Tafsir. I've got time. Did you stop One the time? Minute. No, it's still going. Because it was one six. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just loading up the tafs here. So it says from Ibn Kafir, this ayah means, O oh Jews, let me get the right part. Okay, so it says, and asked the Muhammad about the town which was spicy when they transgressed in the matter of the Sabbath i.e. Saturday, when their fish came to them openly on the Sabbath day and did not come to them on the day they had no Sabbath, thus we made a trial for them, for they used to rebel. And if I find the part later on, so basically what I'm trying to say is, okay, I've, how much time have I got? 25 seconds. I'll come to it, but it says, when the fish came in abundance on Saturday as usual, they were caught on the ropes and nets for the rest of the Saturday. During the night, the Jews collected the fish after the Sabbath ended. So what they did, they put the nets on the Friday night and they collected it on the Sunday. So they didn't directly disobey Allah, but Allah still turned them into apes because he said, do not do anything on the Sabbath. So they actually kept the Sabbath because they put the nets out on the Friday. So why would a merciful God still punish them for using their intellect? Okay, using their intellect, yeah, using the intellect wasn't the point. The point was they put the nets there to catch the fish. That is kind of work. They, what is the purpose of Sabbath? Sabbath is where you rest according to the Jewish standards. It doesn't mean you go and put out the nets for the next day's fishing. Yes, so they actually did disobey God's command. Yes, remember in the case of Jesus, they said, why did you raise this person from the dead? Yes, on a Sabbath. Yes, and Jesus explains to them this was a life and matter, uh, life and death thing that's different. And he did not. He, did, he basically explains his reason. But in the case of the Jews, they were cast, catching fish, nothing to do with life and death. Yes, it was a temptation for them that the fish were coming, and they said that this is the only way we can use a loophole to get around the uh, 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 the fact that God told us not to catch fish on this day. But anyway, to me, these were the people who were punished, not the children, not the infants. The important thing is the people who committed. This particular disobedience were punished, not somebody else. But in the case of, of uh, Moses, Numbers 31, uh, uh, Numbers 31, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the Israelites. After that, you will be gathered to your people. So Moses said to the people, Arm some of your men to go to war against the Midianites, so that they may carry out the Lord's vengeance on them. You see, the reason is vengeance. It is nothing to do with the crime the crime of the people. If it is, then God would have said so, unless you're telling me the Bible is lying about them. And this is the case with the Amalekites as well. If you read 1 Samuel 15, the beginning, it tells again the reason was for what they did to the Israelites. Okay, now we go to another passage with regards to uh, the Bible. It says in the Bible, um, yeah, about, about the women, yes? When, sorry, um, so this, is, this comes under what is considered to be moral, immoral in the case of the woman. Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church, now as the church submits to Christ, as also the wife should submit to the husbands in everything. So you see the wife is like, so someone submitting to the husband sorry to, uh, to God so the wife when she submits to the husband is as if she's submitting to God it says your wife submit to your husband as to the Lord now what is the relationship between a wife and a husband and a human being and the Lord when we as Muslims submit to Allah we submit and that is submission to our God we our wives do not submit to us as they would submit to Allah now this is the 
another thing which you have to explain in the case of the Bible with regards, there are many other such verses. So it says in Colossians 3.18, Wife, submit yourselves to your husband as fitting in the Lord. Colossians 3.18. What time okay. did we start? Is it? It's been, it's been half an hour. Almost like 30 minutes now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's wrap up soon. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so again, Hashim seems to bring up many verses in the Bible. So but is that a good thing? Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, 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 sorry. Three, two, one, go. Okay, go. So, Matt Hashim. Now, obviously, he brings up many verses in the Bible and say, how can God do this? How can God do that? But then I feel sometimes Hashim doesn't read his own Islamic literature. Why? Because, for example, if we go to Bukhari, it says, narrated Abu Herrera, the people of the scripture, the Jews, used to recite the Torah in Hebrew and used to explain it in Arabic to the Muslims. On that, Allah's Messenger said, do not believe the people of the scripture or disbelieve them, but say we believe in Allah and what is revealed to us. And if I, let me just continue, find the next part, and I'll explain what this means. Okay. It's related to the topic, yeah? Yes. Okay. That's important. Because, for example, Al Hafaz ibn Hajar said in Fath al Bari, do not believe the people of the book and do not disbelieve them, which means if they tell you, you may be true or false, lest it be true and you disbelieve it, or lest it is a lie and you believe it. 